That contains a powerful magnet that creates a magnetic field. When wires are rotated rapidly through this field, then a current of electricity is produced. Now, if we only had a superhero who could stand here and turn the generator real fast, then we wouldn't need to burn so much fuel <laughs> to make electricity. Benjamin Franklin flying his kite was searching for electricity. Something to do with the light in the solar Electricity, electricity Rubbing a comb with wool or fur Will give you a charge of static Electricity, stroking a cat to make it purr You're building up static Electricity, electricity Electricity at rest is called static electricity Like in the winter, wearing a heavy coat You get a shock off the doorknob Or you scrape across the carpet and sneak up on your very best friend and sap him on the ear with a shock of electricity. Current flowing to and fro makes a circuit of electricity, electricity. Voltage is the pressure that makes it go is pushing up electricity, electricity. Watts will tell you just how much you'll be using up electricity, electricity. Powerful stuff, so watch that plug is potent. Electricity, 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 electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a If you take a piece of wood and put it next to another piece of wood, nothing happens. And if you take a piece of granite and put it next to another rock, still nothing. But if you take this piece of iron and put it next to this other piece of iron, magic. I mean, magnet. Magnetic objects are able to magically attract at long distances because they generate magnetic fields that extend invisibly out beyond the object. But the mystery is this. Where do magnetic fields come from? Well, that's easy, Henry. We've known for a long time that electricity and magnetism are really just two sides of the same coin. Kind of like mass and energy or time and space. They can be transformed into one another. And in fact, a magnetic field is just what an electric field becomes when an electrically charged object starts moving. That makes sense for explaining why a current of electrons flowing through a wire causes this compass needle to move, or how currents in the Earth's outer core generate the geomagnetic field. But a bar magnet or the compass needle itself are just pieces of metal without any electrical current running through them. Or are they? At the microscopic level, there are loads of electrons whizzing around the atoms and molecules that make up any solid. Right. This brings up an excellent point. The magnetic behavior of any everyday object is influenced by a fascinating combination of effects ranging from the level of particles to atoms, collections of atoms, and collections of collections of atoms. First, individual particles. Unlike the everyday workings of gravity and electricity, permanent magnets can only be fully understood as a quantum mechanical effect, in much the same way that particles like electrons and quarks have fundamental properties called mass and electrical charge, most particles also have another intrinsic property called tiny magnet. 
Just kidding, it's called intrinsic magnetic moment, but really that's just technical mumbo jumbo saying that particles with electric charge also happen to be tiny magnets. If you want to know why they're tiny magnets, well you may as well ask why are particles charged in the first place? Or why do objects with mass and energy attract each other gravitationally? No one knows. We just know that's the way the universe works. Exactly, and since the 1920s, we've known that each individual electron or proton is basically a tiny magnet, which brings us to the level of atoms. An atom is a bunch of positively charged protons with a bunch of negatively charged electrons whizzing around them. The proton tiny magnets are about a thousand times weaker than the electron ones, so the nucleus of the atom has almost no effect on the magnetism of the atom as a whole. And you might think that since many, though not all, of the electrons are also moving, that like the current in a wire, they should generate magnetic fields due to that motion. And indeed they do. These are called orbital magnetic fields. Except these don't usually contribute to the magnetic field of an atom. Here's why. Electrons in atoms are accurately and complicatedly described by quantum mechanics, but the gist of the story is that electrons congregate in shells around the nucleus. The electrons in any filled shell zoom equally in all directions, so the currents they generate cancel out and generate no magnetic field. These electrons also come in pairs whose tiny magnets point in opposite directions and also cancel. However, in a half-filled shell, all of the electrons are unpaired, and their tiny magnets point in the same direction and add up, meaning that it's the intrinsic magnetism of the electrons in the outer shell that gives an atom the majority of its magnetic field. So atoms near the side of any of the major blocks of the periodic table, which have full or nearly full outer electron shells, aren't magnetic, and atoms in the middle of the blocks have half-full outer electron shells and are magnetic. For example, nickel, cobalt, iron, manganese, chromium, etc. Wait, but chromium isn't magnetic. Ah, but just because an atom is magnetic doesn't mean that a material made up of lots of that atom will be magnetic, which brings us to the level of crystals. When a bunch of magnetic atoms get together to make a solid, they generally have two options. One is for all the atoms to align their magnetic fields with each other, or they can align their magnetic fields in an alternating fashion so they all cancel out. The atoms will do whichever one requires less energy. That's why chromium, for example, is a very magnetic atom, but a very unmagnetic solid, because it's one of the most anti-ferromagnetic materials that we know. Iron, on the other hand, is the namesake of ferromagnetism, so it is unsurprisingly ferromagnetic. Or, in usual parlance, <laughs> magnetic. Sometimes. The last and final level of magnetism is that of domains. Essentially, even in a magnetic material where the magnetic fields of atoms line up together, it's possible that one chunk of the material will have all its atoms lined up pointing one way, and another chunk will have all its atoms pointing another way, and so on. If all of these domains are of a similar size, then none may be strong enough to force the others to align with it. In which case, a piece of iron, for example, may have no magnetic field at all because of all the warring magnetic kingdoms within it. However, if you apply a strong enough magnetic field from outside the material, you can help one domain expand its control over its neighbors, and so on, until all of the domains have been unified into one kingdom, all pointing in the same direction. And now, finally, you can rule with an iron fist! I mean, magnet. It's magnetic because it's ferromagnetic and all of the domains are aligned. Exactly. What's remarkable is that magnetism is a fundamentally quantum property amplified to the size of everyday objects. Every permanent magnet is a reminder that quantum mechanics underlies our universe. In order for an everyday object to be magnetic, though, it has to have a unified kingdom of magnetic domains, each made up of bajillions of magnetic atoms which also need to be aligned with each other, each of which can only be magnetic in the first place if it has an approximately half-filled outer shell of electrons so their intrinsic magnetic fields can align and not cancel each other out. Not surprisingly, these criteria are pretty difficult to fulfill, which is why there are only a limited number of suitable materials you can use when you're building a magnet. Or you could just run a current through any electrical conductor and produce a magnetic field that way. But hey, why does that work in the first place? Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... Electricity, electricity. Terrestrial magnetism. A freely suspended bar magnet approximately points towards the geographical north with its north pole and the geographical south with its south pole as it comes to rest. 
This is also known as the directive property of a magnet. The direction in which a magnet points changes from place to place on Earth. Similarly, when a magnetic needle is pivoted at its center and allowed to a vertical plane along its north and south, it does not remain vertical but remains inclined to it. This inclination also changes from place to place on Earth. These observations prove that the Earth behaves as a huge magnet. Earth's magnet may be imagined as a giant bar magnet stuffed inside the Earth with two ends running between the geographical sides. But the North Pole of the Earth's bar magnet, called the Magnetic North, lies near the geographical south and the south pole of the Earth's bar magnet called the magnetic south lies near the geographical north. The effect of the Earth's magnet extends up to 528,000 kilometers from its surface. To know the properties of the Earth's magnet one must know some quantities which are called elements of the Earth's magnetic field, which is studied under the name terrestrial magnetism. Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... Electricity, electricity. What? What? Oh, you want to know why this battery and cell wire is in the magnetic kit. Did you know that electricity can also create magnetism? You don't believe me? Okay, take that wire and roll it over a nail. Now tie both ends of this wire to both sides of the battery cell. Take a few paper pins near this nail. See, paper pins are being attracted to the nail. This is called an electromagnet. This magnetic effect comes due to electricity. So when you run an electric current into a wire, it creates a magnetic field, making the wire an electromagnet. The difference between an electromagnet and a regular magnet is that you can increase or decrease the power of the magnet by controlling the supply of electric current. If you increase the amount of current, it becomes more powerful. Similarly, if you decrease the power, it becomes less powerful. So you can control the power of magnetism in an electromagnet. Electromagnets are used in many appliances like the refrigerator, fans, doorbells, etc. And they help make our life easier. Okay now, bye! Electricity, electricity Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... An electric motor is a machine that uses electric energy to produce motion. Electric motors operate a variety of devices, from vacuum cleaners in the home to windshield wipers in the automobile to conveyor belts in the factory. All electric motors that produce rotation work in essentially the same way as a direct current series motor, which is commonly used to drive electric railroad cars. Current flows through a wire to a block of graphite called a brush. The brush transmits current to the commutator, which consists of two or more semicircular split rings. The commutator is connected to a large coil of wire, called the armature, and to the output shaft. Current flows from the commutator through the armature, then back to the commutator. Current then flows through another brush to one or more electromagnets, each made up of a wire coil wrapped around a piece of iron. This flow of current through the magnet's coil produces a field of magnetism. The field has a north pole and a south pole, as shown in this simplified picture. The current in the armature, one loop of which is shown, interacts with the magnetic field in the coil, producing motion. The direction of this motion depends upon the directions of the field and the current. The split ring of the commutator interacts with the brush to keep the armature current flowing in the same direction relative to the field. Thus the loop and the output shaft continue to rotate in the same direction. Induction motors are the most commonly used electrical machines. They are cheaper, 
rugged, and easier to maintain compared to other alternatives. In this video, we will learn the working of a three-phase squirrel cage induction motor. It has two main parts, stator and rotor. Stator is a stationary part, and rotor is the rotating part. Stator is made by stacking thin slotted, highly permeable steel laminations inside a steel or cast iron frame. Winding passes through slots of stator. When a three phase AC current passes through it, something very interesting happens. It produces a rotating magnetic field. To understand this phenomenon much better, consider a simplified three phase winding with just three coils. A wire carrying current produces magnetic field around it. Now, for this special arrangement magnetic field produced by three-phase AC current will be as shown at a particular instant. With variation in AC current, magnetic field takes a different orientation as shown. From these three positions, it's clear that it's like a magnetic field of uniform strength rotating. The speed of rotation of a magnetic field is known as synchronous speed. Assume you're putting a closed conductor inside it. Since the magnetic field is fluctuating, an EMF will be induced in the loop according to Faraday's law. The EMF will produce a current through the loop. So, the situation has become like a current carrying loop is situated in a magnetic field. This will produce magnetic force in loop, according to Lorentz law. So, the loop will start rotating. A similar phenomenon happens inside an induction motor also. Here, instead of a simple loop, something very similar to a squirrel cage is used. Three-phase AC current passing through stator winding produces a rotating magnetic field. So, as in the previous case, current will be induced in bars of squirrel cage, which is shortened by end rings, and will start rotating. That's why it's called an induction motor. Electricity is inducted in the rotor by magnetic induction rather than direct electric connection. To aid such electromagnetic induction, insulated iron core lamina are packed inside the rotor. Such small slices of iron make sure that eddy current losses are minimum. This is another big advantage of a three-phase induction motor. It is inherently self-starting. So, you can see here that both magnetic field and rotor are rotating. But, at what speed will the rotor rotate? To obtain this answer, let's consider different cases. Consider a case where the rotor speed is the same as the magnetic field speed. Since both are rotating at the same speed, the rotating loop will always experience constant magnetic field. So, there won't be any induced EMF and current. This means zero force on rotor bars. So, the rotors will gradually slow down. But as it slows down, rotor loops will experience a varying magnetic field. So, induced current and force will rise again. And the rotor will speed up. In short, the rotor will never be able to catch up with the speed of the magnetic field. It rotates at a specific speed, which is slightly less than synchronous speed. The difference between synchronous and rotor speed is known as slip. Rotational mechanical power is transferred through a power shaft. In short, in an induction motor, electrical energy is entered via stator and output from motor. Mechanical rotation is received from rotor. Energy loss during motor operation is dissipated as heat. So, a fan at the other end helps in cooling down the motor. Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... Electricity, electricity. Every room can now be lit with just a... Electricity, electricity. Where do you think it all comes from, this powerful... Ele electromagnetic induction. Prepare a circular coil out of copper wire. 
Connect the two ends of this coil to the two terminals of a sensitive galvanometer with a scale having zero at the center. This closed circuit is shown in the diagram. Note that this circuit contains no source of electricity and the galvanometer shows zero reading initially. Take a bar magnet NS and move it swiftly towards the coil with its north pole facing the coil. You will observe a deflection in the galvanometer when the magnet is moving. The deflection indicates that current is set up in the coil. Now, move the magnet away from the coil. The galvanometer shows again a deflection, but in the opposite direction. This means current is set up in the opposite direction. If you hold the magnet with its south pole facing the coil and repeat the above steps, the deflections are again observed, but are reversed. Similarly, motion of the coil itself also produces deflections in the galvanometer when the magnet is kept stationary. Do you observe any deflection when you just hold the magnet stationary near the coil at rest? No. A relative motion of a magnet and a coil induces the current in the coil. The current produced by a relative motion of the coil or the magnet is called an induced current and is said to be set up by an induced electromotive force, EMF. The production of an induced EMF in a coil in a closed circuit by the relative motion of a magnet and its coil is called the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction. Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... In this animation, we'll look at how a transformer works. This is a typical oil-cooled step-down transformer. Transformers step voltages up or down. Electricity comes in on one side at one voltage and goes out on the other at a different voltage. On the outside of the transformer are a number of external components. Some help it to remain at a good working temperature, some help make it safer in the event of an accident, and some are used for monitoring. The radiator fins help cool the oil in the case. The conservator tank allows for the oil to expand and contract as it heats and cools. The explosion vent protects the transformer in the event of a major fault. The bushings insulate the conductors where they enter the case. The tap changer sets the exact amount of voltage change. The Buckholtz relay lets us detect the presence of gas caused by the deterioration of the oil and or a rapid increase of oil pressure. Let's look inside the case at the transformer itself. Within each transformer case are three actual voltage transformers, one for each phase. Each has its own conductor in and conductor out. A transformer is a laminated steel core surrounded by two different layers of wire windings. One set of windings has fewer loops of wire than the other. The one with fewer loops is the low voltage set of windings. The low voltage windings sit between the core and the high voltage windings. Let's see how it works. The current comes into the transformer through a conductor that joins onto the high voltage windings. This induces a magnetic flux in the iron core. This flux induces a current in the low voltage windings. Because there are fewer complete loops of wire in the second set of windings, the current sent out from them has a lower voltage than the one that came in. To adjust the final voltage further, we can use tap changes. These reduce the number of windings on the low voltage side still further by changing the location of the conductor that leads out of the transformer. Notice how the sine wave reduces as the tap changer connects to fewer windings, reducing the voltage. Electricity, electricity, flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... Electricity, electricity.
electricity. Let's begin by looking at how a simple circuit allows a light bulb to light. A circuit is a route through which electrical current can flow. In our example, electrons flow from the negative side of a D-cell battery to a conducting material on the base of the bulb. From there, the electrons flow up a wire that is inside the bulb and across the filament, which is the part of the bulb that actually lights. When the electrons go through the filament, some of the electrical energy is changed to heat and light energy. The electrons continue down another small wire inside the bulb to another conductor on the base of the bulb. The electrons finally make their way to the positive side of the battery. There would not be a complete circuit if the electrons did not travel to the positive side of the battery, and the bulb would not light. When there is an unbroken path on which electrons flow, as in this example, it is called a complete circuit. The unbroken path that the electrons follow is called a closed circuit because electricity will only flow on an unbroken path. The light bulb will not light unless there is a closed circuit. Now look closely at the light bulb and you'll notice that there is an insulator between the conductor that leads up to the filament and the conductor that leads away from the filament. Remember that the atoms of conductors easily accept and pass on electrons. The atoms of insulators do not. As we discussed in the first section of the lesson, electrons will not easily pass through insulating material that surrounds a wire. If an insulator did not surround a wire carrying a current, it is possible for the electron flow to get directed to another conductor that comes into contact with the circuit. Electricity will follow the path of least resistance. If the electrons take a path short of the complete circuit, it is called a short circuit. Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you get? You get a... Electricity, electricity. Every room can now be... Let's experiment a little bit with circuits. As we discussed, Electricity will only flow on a closed circuit such as the one shown on the screen. Notice that the electrons flow through the wire and each of the bulbs before they return to the battery. If one of the wires breaks, a gap occurs in the circuit and all the lights go out. When lights are lined up one after the other on a circuit like these lights are, it is called a series circuit. The problem with a series circuit is that when one light burns out and its filament breaks, it creates a gap in the circuit. All the lights go out because electricity won't be able to flow to the other bulbs. This problem can be solved with a parallel circuit. In a parallel circuit, the wires that are connected to light bulbs run parallel to each other rather than having all the bulbs in a row. This means that one light can burn out or be removed and the other lights on the circuit will stay lighted. For example, if we remove the light that is closest to the battery, the other two lights don't go out because each light is connected in a way that the electrons have a complete path to travel to the positive side of the D-cell battery. Now let's practice what we've discussed about circuits with an activity. Electricity, electricity. Flip that switch and what do you you get a electricity, electricity. Every room can now be.